see you this morning. Welcome to BH One of Your Church. It's lovely to have you all here today. Would you stand with me? We're gonna we're gonna start our service with prayer this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Would you just uh, just get your heart into a place of worship this morning? Get your heart into a place where you can see God, where you can connect with Him, where you can. Look towards him, where you can see his face. We're here this morning not to serve ourselves, but to serve God, to worship him. We're not here to um, make ourselves feel better or to fulfill some kind of obligation. We're here to worship the living God this morning. Isaiah chapter 40 says, Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So 46 this week, I'm officially closer to 50 than I am to 40. And uh, I feel it sometimes. We spent the entire day gardening yesterday. Well, I spent the entire day gardening. Karen spent the entire day telling me where she wanted to go. And uh, when I went to bed last night, when I got up this morning, I could feel it. Feel it in my bones. But God, you know, He revives us. He revives us in our soul. He revives our spirit. I can get up this morning and my body might complain at the fact that I'm getting up, but my spirit rejoices in my Savior because I'm refreshed in Him. Father, today as we worship You, as we praise You, as we lift up Your name, we ask for that you will inhabit our praises. We ask, Father, that you will do your work within us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Right. Let's worship the Lord this day.
there is no other name. There is no other name under heaven by which people might be saved. And we thank you, God. We thank you that your word tells us that you are the way, the way, the truth, the life. That nobody comes to the Father except through you. Thank you, God, that you made a way to heaven where there was no way before. That you, Father, by your own sacrifice, by your own blood, by your own suffering, you made a way for us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we are so unworthy of the grace that you pour out on us. But Lord, you love us so much, you pour it anyway. And Lord, today, we come to you even in our unworthiness. And we ask you that you will lift up our hands. You will raise us up as we bring over on wings of eagles. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Take your seats, which we just read. A moment of welcome to the A20 Living Official. First time here uh, this morning that we welcome you. Uh, we, we still have a one-way system in operation if you need the uh, loose there out through that door there and then come back in through the door at the back there. That's just to stop people uh, crossing over in the in the doorways. And then at the end of the service, it's out through this door here. Turn right and uh, out of the back door into the into the car park. And uh, of course, you can now stand and chat in small groups in the in the car park. That's absolutely fine. We want you to do that. Uh, of course, keep masks on if you feel. Uh, uh, safer that way outside, then we encourage you to do that. Now, last week you will remember that we took up an offering for the work of uh, the recovery ministry, Daily Battles Recovery Ministry that Sam and Amanda are undertaking in the church. And I think we can all uh, say without reservation how incredibly blessed the life of this church is by having that ministry here, by being able to support that ministry. And uh, I, I said last week, that what I realized the week before was that uh, Sam uh, particularly not only is giving his time to the ministry, but is also supporting it himself financially. And so what we wanted to do was to start a fund to, uh, to, to be able to give them uh, a float, to be able to give them some, some money of their own so that it's not all coming out of Sam's pocket. And we were incredibly blessed last week with what was given. Um, we realized that there are people here this week who might not have had an opportunity because they weren't here last week, it was back holiday weekend, and we have a lot of people away, etc. So we're going to uh, take up that offering again uh, in just a few moments when we sing our next song. And what I'm going to ask is, um, I'm going to ask Jesse if you would take up our normal everyday church offering as we start to sing our next song. So Jesse's going to come around with a basket. That's our everyday church offering for uh, support of the work of the church. That's your tithes and offerings in there. And then um, when Jesse comes in and just puts that basket back down, if you want to give into the recovery ministry, there is a second basket here you will see with some envelopes. There's some hand gel there. There are pens in there. Please just uh, pop your offering in that basket. The envelopes are for if you are a um, taxpayer, you can pay. You, you can put your name on there, your details on there, and we can claim back uh, the tax that you've paid on that the, by gift aid. So uh, if you give a hundred pounds, we get hundred and twenty-five pounds. If you give a thousand pounds, we get very blessed, but we also get. <laughs> £1,250 out from that, if that makes sense. So it's worth claiming that, uh, that tax back. We get 25 feedback, or the ministry gets 25 feedback for every pound that is given. So uh, Jesse's going to come and take up our weekly offering, and then as Jesse puts that basket down, if you want to come and uh, give into that, I recognise most people gave last week into that, but if you uh, want to give into that this week, then that basket and the envelopes are here. Please do that and please avail yourselves of the hand gel afterwards. Okay, let's worship the Lord. Let's stand together. Is it good to be able to worship Jesus? Isn't it good? I heard one amen there. Isn't it 
good to be able to worship Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Holy Spirit. Lord, keep us focused on what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, once, once a year, uh, at no particular time, just generally once in every year, I like to take uh, four Sundays to preach on what is called the Four Square Gospel. The Four Square Gospel is uh, basically uh, Christ the Saviour, Christ the Healer, Christ the Baptizer of the Holy Spirit, and Christ the Coming King. And th these are, uh, for those of you who have been around Elam churches for some time, <clears throat> if you look into our uh, foundational beliefs uh, on our website, you will see that that four square gospel is, is what is called the four pillars of Elam. They are the four concepts that hold up, that support everything that Elam churches across this country and indeed around the world uh, focus on that four square gospel. You won't find the word four square gospel in the Bible, it is rather four concepts of Christ that have been pulled together to give us a well rounded picture of who Jesus is. Not who Jesus was, but who Jesus is today and the relevance that he has in each of our lives today. So today we are going to be looking at Christ the Saviour. Next week we'll be looking at Christ the Healer, the week after that Christ the Baptizer and the Holy Spirit, and the week after that Christ the Coming King. So, of course this has relevance to our lives because we can see who Jesus is through this. It's all about finding out more about who he is. And I want to start, as I said, by looking at this subject of Christ the Saviour. But when we do this, when we look at Jesus as Saviour, there are questions that we must ask. And those questions are, why do we need a Saviour and what do we need saving from? I was walking through town on Saturday, I think, no, Thursday, and the, the day off for my birthday on Thursday, I've got to come back, do you like it? And uh, you don't have to say anything. It's okay. I was a bit self-conscious wearing this because I've never worn a cravat before. But then uh, Andrew Dobbins came in and he was wearing a cravat, so I thought it's fine, it's good. I'm in the club. It's all right. So I was walking through town on Thursday, and I saw a guy with a placard, which basically said, "You are going to hell." All have said, "You are going to hell." And it reminded me of a time several years ago I was walking through Southampton High Street and there was this guy stood on this raised uh, flower bed thing and he was preaching, I'll use the term quite loosely, he was shouting at people as they walked past and it was a crowded high street but there was a big empty semicircle of people around as people were detouring to get around this guy. And I was in a bit of a rush so I kind of cut across the middle of it and as I walked through he stopped me and he said, you, do you know you're going to hell? And I thought, that's a bit rude. <laughs> and I looked at him, square in the eye, and I said, I'm square in the eye? Where does that phrase come from? It's more like round in the eye, isn't it? But anyway, I looked at him square in the eye and I said, no, I'm not. And walked on. I had no desire to engage the guy in conversation or to uh, tell him that I was in fact a Christian, I was in fact a pastor, that I was quite secure in my salvation. But we must, if we are telling people that they need a saviour, if they are telling, if we are telling people that they have sinned, then we need to explain why we need a saviour, we need to explain what sin is, we need to explain what people need saving from. So in doing that this morning, I want to have a look at a conversation that Jesus had with a man named Nicodemus. You'll find it in John chapter 3. And uh, this is one of the most famous conversations that Jesus had in his ministry because it contains, this conversation contains those words of John 3.16, which most of us would know, <clears throat> for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not die but will have eternal life. That was the first verse I ever memorized in the Bible. In fact, I remember I memorized the verses after that, 16 and 17, uh, sorry, 17 and 18 as well. But I didn't understand it. I remember learning it in Sunday school, but not really understanding it. 
And then actually, if you look at John chapter 3, there is so much more in this conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And uh, apparently it was the first Irishman in the Bible, I was told, before uh, the service today, Nicodemus. No, <laughs> thank you. Well done. <laughs> Some of you got it. That's okay. But Jesus had this entire conversation with Nicodemus. And so we're going to look at that conversation today. But first, what I want to do is talk to you about snakes. Yes, snakes. There are not many animals in the Bible. Uh, sorry, there are not many animals in the Bible. There are not many animals. There are all the animals in the Bible, actually. Uh, there are not many animals that strike a primal fear in the hearts of many people more than snakes. Possibly spiders, but snakes would probably be a close second. Maybe it's the way they move, the way they slither, the way uh, uh, their venom may be, the fact that we know that, that they can be poisonous. Maybe it's their hiss, but whatever it is, many people find snakes frightening. Just pop up a hand if you have a healthy fear of snakes. Anybody? Yeah, a few, a few people here today are res have a respectful fear of snakes, maybe an irrational fear of snakes, I don't know. But I had a pet snake when I was a teenager. It was uh, about three and a half, four foot long. It was not particularly impressive, but I thought it was cool to have a pet snake when I was a teenager. And um, what it did was it gave me a fascination with snakes, but it also gave me a healthy respect for snakes in learning how to handle the snake and in finding out lots about different species of snakes and what they do and what they can do. Now in Numbers 21, sorry, no, before that actually, I want to say in the Bible snakes are symbolic of evil. They represent the work of the devil and the insidious or devious nature of the hearts of men and women when they turn against God. So as you read through scripture and you see different references to snakes, of course, starting in the Garden of Eden where Satan himself came to Eve in the guise of a snake. We know throughout scripture that that is, is kind of what they represent. Now in Numbers 21, we catch up with Moses and the people of Israel. And they are wandering in the desert. We all know the story, yeah, that they, they come through the Red Sea. They come out of slavery in Egypt. God had brought the plagues on Egypt and they come out of the people who have been released, you know, let my people go and all of that. That's when you get it out from me sitting this morning, I promise you. But God brought the people out of Egypt. He brought them to the Red Sea, part of the waters of the Red Sea. And the people, a whole nation of people came through the Red Sea and the sea closed on the Egyptians who were pursuing them to kill them. And God saved his people and he brought them into the desert. And of course, we all know that they wandered in the desert. But through that wandering in the desert, God provided for people in many, many different ways. And in Exodus chapter 15, God brings the people of Israel to a place called Elim. It's a place of palm springs, uh, palm trees and springs of fresh water. The people came there and they were refreshed. That's what Elim means. It means place of refreshing. That's where this denomination gets its name from. How many times do I answer the phone in the office and people say, is that the Elm Church? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but it just means place of refreshing. And then God supplies his people with manna from heaven, food, literally food from heaven. Everything they need is given to them. But they just don't stop complaining and turning from God. Is that not the very nature of men and women today? We see everything that God has done and is doing for us. And still it's not enough. Still we find reason to complain. Still we wonder about things. Still we want to complain against God and say, why don't we do things this way? Why don't we do things that way? We want God to be God. Morality. 
morality by our standards. But God is the standard of morality. God is the standard of spirituality. God is the standard of true humanity. That's who He is. And He wants to give that to us. He wants to impress that upon our souls. But we so often try and box Him into who we think He should be. But God does this. He supplies His people in the desert with everything they need. Numbers 21 verses 4 to 9 says, They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? Hang on a minute. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? Just a little while ago, they were in slavery. They were in forced labor. They were being beaten. They were being tortured. They were nothing. They were owned by the people of Egypt. And here they are just a little while later. They say, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Oh, there is no bread. There is no water. We detest this miserable food. God is giving them food from heaven. And they're fed up with it. Verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes amongst them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We've sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anybody who's bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked at the bronze snake and they lived. Now at first glance, it can seem that God is being a bit mean here. So the people were complaining. They were having a bit of a whinge. And then God comes along and he says, I'm not having any of that. Here, have a snake, have a bite. And he chucks all these snakes at the people. But verse 5 says the people spoke against God and against Moses. They had literally turned their hearts from God. And then where it says God sent the snakes, the word for sent in the original language here is actually more akin to release or let go. It's the same word used when Moses released the dove from the ark. You get that, sorry, not Moses, no, it was Noah who released the dove from the ark. That's my theology out the window. You get this picture of Noah, don't you? With the bird in his hands. For all intents and purposes, he's restraining that bird. And then he opens his hands, and the bird flies away. In Numbers 21, God is protecting the people of Israel. His hands are around them, but they start to struggle. They start to bite at his hands. Metaphorically, they start to struggle against God. And so his hands that are protecting them are opened because he won't keep people against their will. The consequences then are not a result of a vengeful God, but of a people that would rather take their own chances in the desert with snakes than follow God. But God always uses this. As an opportunity, God always finds opportunity in adversity. When adversity comes in your life, give it to God and He will always bring an opportunity out of that. Does the New Testament not tell us He uses all things for the good of those who are called according to His purpose? It doesn't mean God makes Bad things happen, but it means He will use those things when they happen for our benefit every time. So He uses this to teach the people about His grace and His mercy, and He uses it to teach us something of His forgiveness and salvation. So He instructs Moses to create this bronze snake which He lifts up on a pole. And when the people fix their eyes upon it, the venom in their system is neutralized and they live. But what does this have to do with Jesus? What does this have to do with now, with today? Enter Nicodemus. 
This is one, as I said earlier, one of the most remarkable conversations recorded in the history of the world. Let me share a part of that conversation with you. John 3, 14 to 18. Just as though this is Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes might have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the one and only Son. Nicodemus was an interesting case. He was a religious ruler. He was a scholar. He came to Jesus at night because he was afraid to come to him in the day when people might see him talking to Jesus. Now it can never be said that Jesus was just uh, ministering towards the unlearned and towards the common and towards the simple-minded people like me that came to Jesus. But Jesus' appeal was then and still is across the board. He breaks down barriers of culture and of intellect, as well as race, of class, of religion, of social status, of gender, or any other barrier that people might raise between them and God. Jesus always has been and always will be, and he continues to be the biggest draw of people across the globe. To the scientists, he is revealed in the molecular structure of the human form, the wonder of creation and nature, and in the cosmic expanse of the heavens. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim his hand. Work. Day to day he pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Now to the man or woman, the person on the street, he's revealed in compassion. He's revealed in provision. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. On every level, at every segment of society, in between, he connects with people on their level. And he will connect with you today on your level. He will find you where you are at. And so Nicodemus is having this conversation with Jesus. And Jesus makes this reference to Moses. A story which Nicodemus would have known well. And the parallel that Jesus was drawing here wouldn't have been lost on him. He would have known the sin and the separation from God and the saving from that sin and separation from God. He would have known what Jesus was referencing there when he referenced the snake. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Jesus is, of course, talking about his own impending crucifixion, but there's a deeper meaning here than simply that reference to being lifted up. As the bronze snake was lifted up on the pole, so Jesus was to be lifted up on the cross. Now when the snakes bit people in the desert, they started to immediately suffer the effects of the snake's bit venom, and they started to die. Now don't forget that the snake represents evil, in scripture. So just as that snake's venom infected the people when they separated themselves from God, so we are all infected with the venom of a fallen world which is separated from God. That venom is called sin, and it is sin that is killing us. Romans 5 12 tells us that death was passed on to all people because of sin. So what is it that this, what is this snake venom that is killing us all? What is sin? 
Sin is simply missing the mark. Sin is putting ourselves outside of God's will for our lives. Sin is being outside of His desire and His plan for your life. Sin is choosing to step away from God. Pastor Gareth is not here today. He's not well. The whole family have got a, a, a bit of a, a, a cold and we wish them well. He said we, we didn't want to come to church looking like a COVID factory. I can understand that. They haven't got COVID. They're just uh, unwell. But they're staying away today. But I was talking to him in the week and he said this sin is part of our nature, twisted from God, from what God intended. Sin in us and through us breathes loss harm and even death into our lives, choices, relationship and our will. Our sin is evident everywhere, from selfishness, toxic habits, greed, unfaithfulness, deception, harm towards others, animals and the world we live in. Sin is not simply defined by what we do, sin is a part of us all and no matter how disciplined we are, it remains a lifetime of we can't beat sin by making really good rules. All the rules do is highlight that sin. The great description of this venom that is killing us all. Romans 3.23, there are two verses in Romans, three chapters apart, that sum this up really well. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. 3.23 says all have sinned, all, everyone, every single one of us, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is death. That's what you earn through your sin, through my sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's not just murderers and people like Adolf Hitler who have sinned. It's all of us, you, me, everybody. It's not just about dying in the body. And yes, we all die. We all die because of the presence of sin. The presence of sin in the world means that there is the presence of death in the world, physical death. But this is about dying in the soul. This is about eternity. Our separation from God, our sin is the venom that is killing us all and none of us have the cure within ourselves. You will not find the cure to sin in therapy. You will not find the cure to sin in relationships. You will not find the cure to sin in possessions or in money. You will not find the cure for this venom uh, in a bottle or in a needle or in a pill. You will not find it in politics. You will not find it in social media. You won't even find it in trying to live a good life or in karma or in sending out positive thoughts. So where will you find this cure? Where will we find the Savior to save us from this venom? Numbers 2.19, so Moses made one snake and put it up on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by the snake, they looked at the bronze snake and they lived. John 3.14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes might have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Yes, it's the third time I've quoted that verse today because it is one of the most important things you will ever hear, if not the most important thing you will ever hear in your life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Will you, this is the invitation now, will you look to the Saviour today? Will you look at Him as He was raised up on the cross to take your punishment for that sin, to take your eternal death for that sin? Will you look at Him on the cross and will you say, Save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. And you can take that verse in John 3.16. And you can personalize that verse. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me, Mark, today. For God so loved Linda. For God so loved Ray. For God so loved Andrew, Jane. For God so loved Caroline. For God so loved Simon. For God so loved Jonathan. For God so loved Tom. Put your own name in there. For God so loved. 
Let's do that. I keep threatening to put the words of grace on the screen over the top, and I keep forgetting to do it. So um, if you know the words of grace, let's share the grace together. If you don't, just be blessed by this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We've got it, haven't we, Tom? I said, I've just seen Tom go to the computer. We... <laughs> God bless you all. Have a fantastic week. Uh, we are on Zoom for communion at uh, 6 this evening. Please do join us for that. If you don't have the link, just drop us uh, an email or a message on social media and we'll send you that link. And uh, of course, we have our Bible study on Zoom on Wednesday evening. So do join us for that. Everybody is welcome. Bless you. Thank you.